Hi, Dave Hudson here with Cosmic Point of View, here with another Cosmic Brief. This time we are talking about the Unistellar EV Scope versus uh, Do It Yourself. Uh, which one is the right path for you? And so if you haven't been to the channel before, uh, this is a Cosmic Brief, which means it is meant to be very brief and to the point. So no fancy graphics or videos here. We're just going to jump right in, get right to the technical details so that you can make the quickest decision you want. Now this is part of a brief for an entire video series, so there's going to be probably eight to ten uh, complete videos in this series that will break all of this down in detail. I'll actually show you the scope in use, show you some other products in use, and how to build your own if you want to do this yourself. So let's just jump right into it. So first, what are we talking about? This is the Unistellar EV scope. Uh, and the question is, is it a game changer that's worth the price? So we'll get into whether it's worth the price. The question is, is it a game changer? And I think it is. It's pushing the market forward. Uh, but what is it? Uh, so it is a smart telescope that is a complete all-in-one package. And so the EV scope is meant to be portable. It's meant to be easy to use. You push a button and off you go. And, and so the question is, what does that mean? What is that promise of ease of use? And it really breaks down to being able to set the telescope up quickly, not having to put anything together or assemble anything, uh, being able to push a button, it points itself where it needs to go, and there's nothing else that you really need to do to be able to start enjoying the sky, night sky. Uh, the other thing is this promise of enhanced vision, and this is what I'm really going to dig into uh, with our review is that the site really touts this enhanced vision that's proprietary technology, etc. And so that's really what I want to look at as uh, is that really a real thing? Uh, are you paying extra for something that is uh, uh, all hype or is it real? And then lastly is the portability, and that's what I really have been working myself towards for a long time, which is can you build a portable uh, setup that you can easily quickly take maybe even on an airplane if you want to go on vacation and take something with you and so that was my ultimate goal I was always doing a lot of traveling and I wanted to have something I could carry on an airplane there will be a whole video on that if you want to know the pains I've gone through trying to create that portability but the catch is what's it gonna cost you and it's going to cost you three thousand dollars a little over three thousand dollars actually uh, if you get the backpack carrying case as well so is this is not a cheap scope uh, I'll talk a little bit more at the end about uh, why it may be worth that 3000 or why it may not. I think this scope is going to struggle at this price point. Um, I think it will have some early adopters, but I don't think it will go much further than that unless they change the price. But really, let's just jump into it. So what are you getting? What are we looking at here? Well, at the end of the day, this is an alt azimuth mount. Uh, so it's not an equatorial mount. Uh, the scope is an F4 uh, 5.5 inch reflector. So uh, that F4, that speed, the focal ratio is very important. Uh, and then the sensor, the sensor that is in this scope is a Sony IMX224, very popular chip, uh, very good actually, uh, ironically, which we'll see in a few moments, it's very good at planetary uh, and decent at DSO imaging, so deep sky imaging, uh, but in this setup it actually is the other way around. Uh, the one thing that is sort of the enhanced vision selling point is it has an electronic eyepiece, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end. Uh, there is a built-in computer that does the stacking, the pointing, uh, plate solving, and all the things that you need to do to view the image, and of course creating a Wi-Fi network to connect your smart device to. And then of course it uh, has a self-contained battery pack that lasts about 10 hours. And then lastly, uh, you do need to control it with something, and that is your own smart device. So you have to bring your own device, uh, and that is something I think is very important to understand about this telescope. If you were to buy this telescope and you did not have a smart device, it does not work. You cannot control it with a hand controller or anything else. You must use a smart device. So, uh, can you build it yourself? Absolutely, yes you can. There are several options. And so here's what I looked at. Uh, I really took all of those components and said, well, how can I buy something very similar to that and even maybe change it up a little bit to see what we could get to. So, uh, if you'll focus here on the, the second column is the iOptron uh, AZ Pro, so the iOptron alt as Pro mount. That's a pretty beefy alt as mount and it's quite costly. It's, it's $1,299, um, but it is a very, very sturdy mount. It handles up to about 30 pounds of payload, so a lot more than you need for this. However, um, it does certainly get you what you need, and I'll cover that in just a moment. Uh, the ZWO ASI224 camera uh, is, is the one that I selected because it's the exact same chip, uh, and it's non-cooled, which is also an important aspect. And then for a battery pack to run everything, uh, a talent cell, which are sold on Amazon, uh, has a great battery pack that I've had good luck with that will last you all night, that will run actually the camera, uh, your computer, and the telescope itself. Uh, the actually the Altas Pro has a built-in battery pack itself, um, so it lasts even longer. And then the computer you need to run this, or a CPU, uh, I chose the ZWO ASI Air Pro. You have other options you could choose out there. Uh, I think StellarMate uh, has an option. There is a Raspberry Astro option out there. 
Uh, and then what about a carrying case? Well, really, I think you can get away with a TSA backpack. Uh, and what I mean by TSA backpack is just one that uh, conforms to the TSA standards. Again, a separate video on that and how you package this thing up. But really, you could just use a carry-on luggage uh, if you take care with it. Uh, and then there are some things you will need, uh, batten off masks, some cables, adapters, and again, if you watch my other videos, you'll see me get into exactly what you need to build all of this. But I also said, well, let's take it a step further. What if we were to go uh, and look at other, maybe possibly cheaper options? So that iOptron uh, AZ Pro is gonna run you about $2,200 all in. So again, you're already saving uh, $1,000. And so to how does that compare? And then you've got the Celestron Nexstar 5SE. Uh, same thing, all we've done here is change out the telescope and the mount uh, for the Celestron 5SE, which is an all-in-one package you can buy for $699, uh, but everything else is exactly the same, uh, except you do need to buy a Starazona Night Owl Point Four focal reducer. If you remember earlier, I mentioned that that uh, F4 focal ratio is gonna be critical, so we wanna have the same focal ratio. So that's gonna run you uh, $1,662, which is about half the price of where we were before. Uh, and then lastly, I said, well, there is the Orion Starblast um, Auto Tracker, a 114, and it's a very, very compact, doesn't come with a tripod, actually comes with a little stand that you can put it on a tabletop. Uh, that is the telescope, it's a, it's a 114 millimeter reflector. Uh, it act, it's actually at f4.4, so it's a little off from what I wanted, but I was able, I, you know, I could have put the Cometron, or actually I did put the Cometron on there because the Cometron from Celestron is an f4 scope. But anyway, basically the other same setup. Um, said you could have bought the optional tripod, but that'll get you in the $1,000 uh, range, anywhere from $1,000 to uh, 1243 if you want to get the optional uh, tripod and so you'll notice I do have that um, you do need and your cables uh, jumps up quite a bit that's because you do need to buy the handheld you cannot control this with a computer uh, without a handheld but let's just jump right into that and so the question is can you build it uh, but does it work so here's the short answer uh, the iAptron AZ Pro worked like a champ had a great time on that so definitely check out that video I spent all night uh, with these two scopes side by side battling it out uh, another night I took out the 5SE and it did quite well itself. However, it did have one shortcoming that I will cover in just a moment, um, but it worked quite well and gave me great views. So that is another option. The Orion uh, Star Blast Auto Tracker was an utter failure. Um, that uh, mount just does not track well at all. Um, and it was not good enough to be used in the situation. Again, you will see that in my follow-up video where I show the 5SE and the Orion DIY. But the bottom line is you have two very viable options, the iOptron AZ Pro and the Celestron 5SE. So what are we talking about here? What is the difference? Well, uh, what's working? To begin with, uh, the EV scope, again, you set it up on your tripod. It has a GPS. Um, it, you basically just take the scope cap off, uh, turn the scope, point it anywhere. Uh, it takes a picture, plate solves, and it's ready to go. The iOptron is actually very similar. It has built-in GPS. Uh, you can go ahead and set it up. And though you do have to do the star alignment, when you get to that point, uh, it is pointing roughly in the right part of the sky. And so therefore, you can actually just hit enter and not look through an eyepiece. And, and then you can go ahead and do your plate solving with the ASI Air Pro. It will sync the mount and get it right where it needs to be. Uh, the next star 5SE, you can't do that. Uh, it does not have GPS built in. It does not auto orient itself. So you actually have to move the scope around and kind of, you know, maybe point it in the right direction of the sky and get it close. Um, and so for that one, I said really doesn't work. Uh, for the Orion, uh, there, there's no option at all. That thing is completely manual, uh, and it is it was very you know challenging to get to do that. So how about tracking? This is the other big piece you need to do. So what I was really looking at is can you do a four second exposure without oblong stars, and can you keep the object that you're looking at within a relative field of view for about 15 minutes? EV scope, I got to give them credit, does a great job. That's a really well tracking mount, um, and uh, takes really great pictures. The iOptron AZ Pro, also rock solid, just as good as the EV scope. I would say I would put those two side by side in terms of their capability to track. And then you've got the Nexstar 5 SE, which wasn't as good. So uh, I would say, you know, it did keep it in the field of view. It kept it in the field of view for a good 20, 25 minutes, but it did drift more than the EV scope and the iOptron. However, with the 5 SE, you do have the option of doing equatorial mode. So it does give you some additional options, which would probably give it a plus in this category in the long term. 
Stacking and Live View capable because we're using the ASI Air Pro. All of these are able to do that and portable enough. I believe so. Uh, again, there'll be a separate video that I will show you how you can pack this up and get it just as portable as the EV scope. So I think we've got really my winner here is the iOptron, and I'll talk about some additional options. But let's really take a look at what we had. So. Uh, what you're going to see as we go through these next few pages is the live uh, the comparisons right so this is live view and so this would be what you're looking at in video mode uh, and so with the EV scope a uh, couple things to point out here what you'll notice is the image seems softer it seems uh, almost actually blurry um, to some degree with the EV scope and I'll explain why that is in a minute um, focus was spot on for all of these tests I did uh, the collimation was done so everything is exactly the same for the um, DYI, which in this case is the Ioptron with the ASI Air Pro uh, on the Cometron 114 reflector, uh, it just looked uh, crisper and cleaner. Uh, I really liked what I was getting a lot better. This was, again, the live view um, as you're looking at it in video mode, if you were, right? So um, not too much different here. Don't see anything that makes me really want to say I want one scope over the other. So now let's get into the enhanced vision. And so they call it enhanced vision. And really all we're talking about here is that the EV scope is stacking, uh, live stacking, right? Just like the ASI Air does, uh, just like SharpCap now does with its uh, live uh, uh, st stacking uh, software, etc. But I found this very interesting. So it looks like the EV scope doesn't have a light pollution filter uh, and it didn't handle the light pollution quite as well. The one thing with the EV scope is it is completely automatic, uh, which means you have very little to no control over what the image looks like. And so you're kind of stuck with that. With the ASI Air Pro, you have a lot of ability to control the image and what it looks like. And it also didn't seem to have this problem um, with this red fringe that was on it. Now these scopes were right next to each other in the exact same spot, so this wasn't a lighting difference or some other problem. Um, this was, uh, or maybe there's something wrong with the chip, I'm not sure. Uh, but it just, you know, I, this is where I started to say, okay, now the DIY one is looking much different, much better to me. And so here we had 56 stacked. Uh, on from the DIY about and it doesn't tell you number of stacked but it's doing four seconds so four minutes um, so you can do the math there and figure out it's a it's a it's very similar to what we're looking at with these two images but here is where I started to say hmm the DIY is starting to look a little bit better the stars are rounder they look cleaner and crisper I'll talk about that in just a moment next would be well, let's look at a DSO so let's look at the uh, M1 the Crab Nebula and what I did notice and I'm gonna go ahead and call this out here is that uh, as when I was looking at the timestamps on my screen, I would notice, for example, um, that uh, when I, the EV scope, even though my iPad had said 20 minutes had uh, gone by, it may say down in the bottom there, uh, seven minutes. And so I think it was counting stacks. It doesn't tell you how many it rejects or throws away. And so it's really hard. Uh, and I did notice that, especially for some reason on the Cigar Galaxy, it really has a hard time. It seems to throw away a lot of the images. Whereas the uh, ASI Air Pro, uh, uh, you can see here, zero ignore, right? It, it had no problem stacking all night long. And then one of the things you're going to see as we go to the next images is sort of the softening that you're going to see in the EV scope images. And so I'll talk about that when we get over to M42 because I think it makes a lot more sense here. But again, exact same time on both of these. They started at the same time. Uh, and, and you can see, I think you have a better image. Now one thing to call out is that on the DIY for the ASI Air Pro, you do not have four seconds as an option. And so I did five seconds. Um, and so yes, you do have one second of extra exposure time here. Uh, but again, I think that's part of it. With the EV scope, you cannot go longer than four seconds. Uh, that's all you can do. They won't allow you to go any further than that. So um, you know the fact that the ASI Air can go to five seconds or 10 seconds um, shouldn't be held against it because the EV scope can't do that. So there's your first ding against the EV scope is not being able to go longer than four seconds with an exposure. So now let's get over to something like M42. Now what you're going to start to see here is that you actually have field rotation, right? Which you know you're going to have to deal with that. And I would say they both dealt with it quite well. Um, no problems dealing with the field rotation. Now what I did realize the EV scope was doing is as it's going along, it appears to be cropping the image. And so it's kind of uh, hiding the field rotation as you go along. Whereas with the ASI Air Pro, um, you know, you just see it right there in front of you. Now you can crop that out as well in your own image. But here's where the real difference is in these scopes. And so for the EV scope, what I really, what I think I figured out is going on is that number one, they are doing, they are using the histogram and really clipping in very, very strongly on the, on the blacks. 
Uh, and so you end up with a lot of data cut off, number one. Number two, they are running some sort of noise reduction routine, which gives it this blurry effect. So if you look at the image on the right, you'll notice that it's very sharp. Uh, you can see the details in the gas lanes and that it looks you know, very much uh, as you would expect it to look, whereas on the left, I noticed that even as more and more data came in, the image never really got any cleaner, any clearer. It was this blurry, little blurry looking image uh, from the EV scope. And this is on all targets. You'll see this is something. And even when you look at the stars, again, go look at the video I have. I zoom in on these stars and you can really see um, that uh, the uh, EV scope is it's doing something to cause it to be you know, blurry looking. And again, I do think what they're doing is running some noise reduction routine. I actually pulled up Photoshop, pulled in um, the DIY, the Ioptron image into Photoshop, ran noise reduction, and the image ended up looking a lot like what was on the EV scope side of the house. So I think, you know, they've got this automatic processing going on, this proprietary enhanced vision technology, uh, which is, you know, it's good for someone who doesn't know how to do anything, but it's also a negative because it's giving you a, a worse looking image. So um, that is the, the, uh, the you know, a, quite a stark difference to me and what you're getting from an image quality perspective. However, if you're wanting to go out and just see some dark uh, DSO, some deep sky um, objects, then yeah, the EV scope works great, um, but I think you're getting something better out of the DIY. So then we go over to the Horsehead Nebula, and I would say the EV scope did very well here as well. But again, you can see these stars, um, you know, again, everything looks softer, right? Whereas you've got a nice, sharper, cleaner image. And I think here you can really see that, yep, exactly that's what's going on. You've got noise reduction that's being applied to the EV scope image, and it's not being applied uh, to the ASI Air image in the DIY uh, scope. But again, you know, you are able to see some really nice, um, um, some views from both scopes. Again, you've got your field rotation that you have on both of these but the EV scope is cropping it out. So uh, lastly, we'll jump over to the cigar. And this is the one I was talking about where uh, I went back and looked at the, you know, ran the footage, so to speak, and actually 20 minutes had elapsed. And so I don't know why the EV scope said seven minutes. Whereas on the DIY, if you just do the math here, you'll see, uh, you know, those are five second exposures. There's 233 of those. It's a lot more than seven minutes. And so um, there's something definitely going on with the EV scope. I actually don't like the fact that they're not telling you what's happening. Is it dropping frames? Is it, is it you know, what is it doing? Why does it only say seven minutes? Is it frozen? I, I don't know. You don't really know what's going on with it. Um, but again, a decent looking image, but one of the other things that I noticed, I think because they are clipping so heavily uh, on both sides, I think they're actually increasing the histogram on the white or the right side, uh, and they're clipping heavily on the left side, the black side, and that's why I noticed on everything uh, M42, the cigar, notice how it's really blown out. So the cores, the bright things are really blown out in the image, whereas on the DIY, it's not as sharp, um, or I'm sorry, it's not as bright, uh, but you actually have more detail in there, and you can play around with the histogram and, and do a lot more things. Okay, so lastly, let's talk about how does the EV scope do with solar system, and this is where I think you really run into a lot of problems, because you cannot change the focal length uh, on the EV scope. It's an, uh, an F4, four and a half inch reflector, which means you're at 450 millimeters. It's actually 3.9, uh, F3.9, which gets you to 450 um, millimeters of focal length. And so this is all you can get from a planetary perspective. And so I've got th three views of planets here. Uh, so the top left one there, uh, this is actually the conjunction that happened uh, back in December, and that is Saturn and Jupiter and three of its moons up in the uh, left there. And so you can see, you know, you have to overexpose to get those moons to come in. But then when I lowered the exposure down, you can see how small Saturn is. So on the bottom picture there, um, you know, Jupiter is overexposed because Saturn is, is much dimmer. Um, but you can see that Saturn, you know, that's the best view you're ever going to get of Saturn from an EV scope. And then if you go to the top image there of the planet, that is Jupiter. Um, so I changed exposure. Saturn disappeared because it was too bright. Uh, but as you can see, you just see a little bit of orange and yellow there. So you, you can tell it's Jupiter, but that's about it. You do get pretty nice views of the moon. So I will give the EV scope credit for that. It does a nice job. You can do digital zoom while you're looking at the moon. It's quite nice. Again, go check out the video. I've got a whole night out with the EV scope alone just so you can see it in action. Uh, but again, want to lay, you know, lay down what's really going on here is that great for DSOs it is not going to be usable for the planets, uh, but you can use it for the moon. So. What about that next star 5 SC? Well, here it is. Uh, it did a great job. Uh, there's a whole video on that if you want to see how the, the 5 SC did, uh, but it did a really great job that night. Uh, I was very happy. Uh, in this image, unfortunately, uh, you'll see in the video, uh, I, something happened and when I changed the camera, 
uh, settings, it didn't save it, and so the gain was actually uh, all the way up, and that's why this core is blown out. Uh, there it actually does a much better job. I think you have an image that competes with the one you saw from the um, from the Cometron on the on the uh, Ioptron AZ mount. But anyway, uh, so it, it worked great. You know, it's the bottom line. So I was very happy with that 5SE. So that is a viable option uh, to build you something for half the price of an EV scope. So let's talk about where does that leave us? So what's our conclusions and what's the summary about all this? So let's quickly go through the pros and cons. Um, again, I would say there is a buyer for this scope out there. Uh, it's not for everyone, but it is gonna be for a certain limited audience, I think. So let's talk about the pros. Ease of use. Uh, this is for the complete novice. So this really is something that if someone is very passionate about this hobby, but they're scared to get into it or don't know how to get into it, uh, this is going to be great for them. It is so easy. Uh, I have some people in my family that would love to have the scope. The problem is the price. Uh, the portability is fantastic. I love the fact that I actually do use the scope now. I take it with me uh, when, I, when I go on road trips. I'll just throw it in the back of the car because it is so easy to carry. Um, and the in electronic eyepiece, uh, the, I'm torn on this one. It's a pro um, because it is nice. It is you know, good to have that electronic eyepiece. The problem is it doesn't work without your phone. So you've got your phone right there or your iPad. So why wouldn't you just look at that? And the eyepiece, though it is, it does give you a, a decent view. I think the novelty of it wears off pretty soon. So I don't know that I would consider that the enhanced vision worth the extra money. And I will say the EV scope uh, is very well built and it does have good tracking. So it's a very well built mount. Uh, and and the, the scope itself is very solid, so it's well built. Bam, but it's got a long list of cons, right? So the cons are a lack of control over the image. You really can't do anything. You can adjust the brightness, uh, basically the brightness and the contrast. And so uh, that's all you can do. You, you can't really do anything else. You can uh, slightly control the image and exposure time. Or, I'm sorry, the gain and the exposure time. Uh, but you're limited to four seconds. Uh, you can't go any more than that. I'm sure they do that because they're worried that the mount is not going to track uh, but longer than that. Uh, and of course the biggest drawback, it's not flexible. You are at an F4 wild, wide field and that's it. You cannot put in any filters in, uh, you can't do anything else with that, uh, um, with that telescope to change its focal length, field of view, anything else. Um, also it is a non-cooled CMOS camera and so I was doing this in uh, it's actually about 29 degrees outside when I've had this thing out uh, and so those are the best images you're going to get. Uh, I have seen another gentleman's website and, you, and he's got the whole year where he did this and you can clearly see in the summer that you're going to get a lot of problems with noise. And so I had that same problem. I have the uh, ATEC, uh, ATEC Infinity uh, live view camera and it's non-cooled and I had the same problems where I would get out in the summer and I was like, wow, this is terrible. The noise is just terrible. Um, again, it's not good for planetary and in my opinion, it's very, very expensive. Um, so. That is something that's going to throw it off. Uh, as I mentioned, I have someone in my family that is, is, you know, would love to get into astronomy and being able to see things, um, but they're certainly not willing to drop $3,000 for something that's probably going to give them a limited amount of joy. So let's talk about building it yourself. So what's the pros? Ease of use. It is just as easy to use as the EV scope. Uh, you're, you're doing it with your iPad or your phone. Um, it is just as portable. Um, you can create a package that is just as easy to carry around. It does take a little bit more time to set it up, but you've got just as portable of a package, just as small and compact, actually a little bit. Uh, you do not have an electronic eyepiece. I shouldn't say uh, that under a pro. Um, uh, this is really more if you don't have the electronic eyepiece. Um, it has good tracking, right? That iOptron uh, Altaz Pro did a great job of tracking. It's a very solid mount. Uh, very flexible, right? So now you can do all sorts of things. You can add in barlows, you can do planetary, you can add in filters, you can do all sorts of things. And you can also upgrade, right? So for a little bit more money, you can now get yourself a cooled camera or get yourself a camera with a, a wider field of view. And you can use filters, right? More importantly, this is good for planetary. And I think that's very important for uh, people who are just getting into this hobby. The planets are a lot of fun. Uh, DSOs can be challenging, um, but this gives you enough power to start looking at DSOs to keep your appetite whetted, um, but it allows you also to do planetary, which is a lot of fun. And more importantly, it's 32% cheaper at least. I do think I have another option where I can get that down to probably a third of the price. Um, the cons though, it's not for the complete novice and so this isn't something I would give to a friend uh, without them having any you know, technical ability because you do have to you know, connect the components together. Again, not that difficult to do, uh, but it, does, it is not as simple, just take it out of the box, put it on a tripod and push one button. 
There is no electronic eyepiece if that's your sort of thing. Again, it's kind of a, a pro and a con here for me uh, because I don't know that, I, I actually don't even use my EV scope uh, eyepiece anymore. I used it the first night uh, for probably 15 minutes and was like, eh, okay. Uh, it's not really something that, that I'm, I'm thrilled about. And this, the setup is slightly more comp, uh, complicated. And of course it is portable, but it is in pieces, right? So you're gonna have the camera, you're gonna have the, the, the telescope, you're gonna have the mount, uh, and a couple of other things uh, to carry along as pieces. But again, you're talking about uh, a three minute setup versus a one minute setup. So I think you can see here where I'm leaning towards this is that the EV scope, while it's great, it's not something I would recommend to someone. I would say, hey, learn a little bit about putting together a telescope uh, go the DIY route because when you have something like the ASI Air Pro, it really does give you the same ease of use um, and the ability to go and look at all kinds of different objects and live stack uh, that you get out of the EV scope. So, what's the summary? Uh, well, this is head-to-head -head pr uh, proved that you can get the same functionality, um, but a lot more capability and flexibility at a much lower price. Uh, there's more testing to come, and so uh, look forward to that. What I did is I actually said, well, let's just go ahead and see how far we can go. And I said, if you've got $3,000, how could you spend that? And so I did get an, um, an Ioptron, uh, I'm sorry, I wanted to put the Ioptron mount, and I bought a 6-inch F4 reflector, uh, and that is not going to work. I, I, I was looking at that. The Ioptron mount can handle it, but you're talking a 6-inch reflector. It gets way too big um, to start carrying around. Uh, so then I said, okay, well, how about if we do the Ioptron Cube, um, which is the uh, little brother, if you will, uh, to the Ioptron AZ Pro, uh, which is a much lower price. Uh, and so that gets you down to $1,300, and you could probably do the same thing. And then you get the Ioptron Cube Pro, uh, which is just a few more dollars. Uh, and I think that really will probably get you exactly what you need. It has GPS. It does the, the um, proximity alignment, everything else. And then you do have another option here. If you wanted to say, hey, I want to kind of go uh, a, little bit, uh, a, a little bit crazy with this, you could go and buy um, the Celestron 5SC OT OTA, right? Just the optical tube. You could get the stars on a focal reducer, but then you could take that and put it on an Ioptron Cube Pro. And to me, you're kind of getting the best of all the worlds there. You've got a great SCT. You got a little bit more aperture. Um, you're definitely going to be able to get yourself a lot more focal length when it comes to looking at the planets. Um, and you could get a different camera. So I actually said instead of the 224, use the 178 uh, MC, which gives you a much wider field of view. Uh, and so I think for two, you know, $2,000, now you're starting to talk about a cooled camera because you could go with the 183. So these are some other options to think about. Uh, the bottom line is when you've got three grand to work with, there are a lot of other things you could do to give you a lot more capability. So what's the conclusion? Well, my conclusion is that while it's a good idea, I think it's like the Tesla of telescopes. Um, it will push the industry forward. It's going to really make other companies say, hey, we've got to get this type of ease of use and capability into the, the hands of our users. Um, however, I think it's way overpriced and it's going to have a very niche market. I think you're going to have a few people that love this thing to death, um, but I would not recommend it to anyone else. The problem is that, as I mentioned, someone that's a novice just trying to get into it, uh, unlikely to want to drop $3,000 just to check out this hobby, right? So um, more importantly, uh, the enhanced vision, in my opinion, does not live up to the hype. It doesn't do anything more uh, than your, your run-of-the-mill uh, live stacking software. Um, as a matter of fact, I would argue it actually does a worse job because it's trying to automate everything um, and it gives you a worse looking image than you could using uh, some of the live stacking software. But if you're looking for a simple all-in-one package and you don't mind the price, it is a really well-built piece of gear. And so I would say if that's what you're looking for, go for it. It'd be a great thing. So. Get more details. This has been the Kazakh Brief. If you want to see the full multi-part series for all the details, live testing, and information on how to build this yourself and make it portable, go check out my YouTube channel, Cosmic Point of View. Subscribe, and I'll start posting all the rest of the videos in this series to tell you all about the Unistellar EV Scope and how you can do it yourself.